Welcome to our presentation tonight, our constitutional moment with Seth Lipsky. My name is Doris Wise Montrose and I am president of Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. Our mission is to ensure that never again remains more than a mere slogan, that freedom and liberty are not lost. This event has the co-sponsorship of four other organizations who work closely with the same goals for all people, peoples. The David Horowitz Freedom Center, the Republican Jewish Coalition, the San Fernando Valley Republican Club, and Jewish Current Issues. We also extended invitations for co-sponsorship to three local democratic groups. The Constitution was born in crisis when the very existence of the United States was in jeopardy. That was Edmund Meese III. The Constitution is the people's document, all people, not just lawyers or judges or government officials. In it, we the people put limitations on our government. We the people limit our government in order to guard and guarantee our own liberty and freedom. This holds true today every bit as much as the day we adopted the Constitution. The Constitution does not give us our freedom. We have the freedom. The Constitution is our way of seeing that government does not overstep its bounds and interfere with that freedom. Just coming here today, we assert and exercise our freedom. Many of our ancestors and many here today fled from countries often at their peril because they were being suffocated by lack of liberty. We cannot allow America, the country that many risked and continue to risk their lives to get to, to become the country fled from. A knowledgeable citizenry is formidable. Who can be the custodians of freedom and guardians of the Constitution but knowledgeable and active citizens? Only if we know what's in the Constitution can we tell if or when government crosses the line, the line that we drew, that we the people established in our Constitution. If any threat arises, if anyone seeks to limit or in any way diminish our freedom, we must know not only our rights, but also understand the, understand the limits to that power. Seth Lipsky, our speaker tonight and author of the book, The Citizen's Constitution, is not a lawyer. He is a newspaper man, a layperson, who understood how important this document is. I can promise you that reading this book will make you a formidable and responsible citizen with the wherewithal to oppose any grab for power, any attempt to infringe on or diminish our liberty and freedom. In the chilling words of John Adams, a constitution of government once changed from freedom can never be restored. Liberty, once lost, is lost forever. Tonight I have the honor of introducing to you another special guest, John Eastman. Many of you may know Dr. Eastman from the terrific segment on the Hugh Hewitt show, The Smart Guys, where Dr. Eastman debates Erwin Chemerinsky on constitutional issues. John Eastman just resigned as Dean of Chapman University School of Law to run for the California State Attorney General. He will offer us a few comments about his perspective on the very real constitutional crisis. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I can't tell you how important this book is and the lecture you're about to hear. But across the country, uh, people are rediscovering that the Constitution is ours. It's not what the judges have made of it, which oftentimes is about 180 degrees opposite of what it actually says. Uh, they make up things in there to use to strike down the will of the people, and then they don't enforce the clauses that are there uh, to uphold our will. Um, one of the reasons that I've decided to get into the Attorney General's race is because I think the constitutional issues that this state is going to confront, whether, whether on uh, uh, the fiscal mess we're in, uh, the, the, the failure to enforce initiatives that we as a people adopt, um, whether, whether it's Marcy's Law or Three Strikes or going back to the 1970s on, on prohibitions on retroactive pay grabs. These things are all part of our Constitution. And, and, and we know what they say. The words are clear. I mean, the Constitution the Constitution is written, both the federal and the state constitutions, so that we and our fellow citizens can understand it and apply it. Um, the President gave a State of the Union address the other night, and he included a line in there about the self-evident truth that all men are created equal as being a, a part of our Constitution. Now, I know the principle is there, but that language actually comes from the Declaration of Independence. 
Um, and it occurred to me that he misunderstood another part of our Constitution, or of our Declaration of Independence as well. And, and for a hundred years, kind of leading intellectual elites have misunderstood. You know, the, con the, the, the government has been expanding at an extraordinary pace in excess of the authority that was granted to it by we the people in the Constitution. And for decades we have allowed that to happen. And those intellectuals have misconstrued our allowing that to happen um, as, as tacit approval of what they were doing. But there's a line in the Declaration of Independence that says we won't lightly overthrow governments uh, while the abuses remain sufferable. But at some point they become insufferable. And it is our right it is our duty to alter or abolish the government so that they're back on track securing the inalienable rights that governments, legitimate governments, are designed to protect. <laughs> there is a counter-intellectual movement now of recovering the original understanding of the Constitution. Even the justices on the Supreme Court that disagree with it have to argue in their opinions uh, that, that, that theirs is the original view. I, I, I'm reminded of the, the, the decision just a few weeks ago, last week in fact, Citizens United, a campaign finance case. Um, Justice Stevens' clerks tried to write an original opinion. They didn't do very well. The master of originalism, Justice Scalia, took him to the woodshed, in his opinion. And you should look at that, because it, it reminds us about our collective right to speak. I mean, the, the law had prohibited people coming together from speaking out against uh, things their government was doing within 60 days in election. I mean, think about that. The freedom of speech was there to protect our right to criticize government more than anything else. And this law prevented that within 60 days in a, with an election, when it mattered most. So ladies and gentlemen, across this country there is a, a new movement, both intellectual and grassroots, of people rediscovering the basic principles of our Constitution. And you're going to hear tonight from Seth Lipsky about how he has put, done that in a book. But, but it's not something that's inaccessible to all of our fellow citizens. And it's up to every one of us to get that Constitution out. Keep it with you all the time. I've got a, a one here that Claremont Institute does. It has the Declaration of Independence at the front of it, so we're reminded of the principles. But keep that with you all the time. And remind our fellow citizens that this is our charter. The government's only power comes from this. And if they're doing things that you can't find in there, you've got to question what they're doing. Anyway, I look forward to the talk, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for having me. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Rick Richman. I edit a blog called Jewish Current Issues, and I am one of the uh, group of bloggers at Commentary Magazine. It is my task this evening to try to explain in two minutes why Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic magazine called Seth Lipsky the most interesting mind in journalism and why that is an understatement. Mr. Lipsky graduated from Harvard University in 1968 where he had been the Harvard campus stringer for Time magazine and had reported from Israel in the weeks following the Six-Day War in 1967. He was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1969 and served as a combat reporter in Vietnam for the Pacific Stars and Stripes. Then he began a career with the Wall Street Journal, during which he served as a reporter in its Detroit bureau assistant editor of its Far Eastern Economic Review, managing editor of the Asian Wall Street Journal, associate editor of the U.S. editorial page, foreign editor, senior editor, and then a member of the journal's editorial board. He also served as editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal Europe, and at one time handled simultaneously the editorial page of the Asian edition of the journal. In January 1990, he resigned from the journal to lead the effort to transform the forward into a national Jewish newspaper, eventually becoming that paper's editor and president, and he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in editorial writing in 1991. After 10 years at the Forward, he left to form the New York Sun, a newspaper that became one of the shining moments in American journalism. 
It quickly became a paper that was read daily by leaders in New York and Washington, D.C., as well as others who enjoyed extraordinarily well-written journalism from a point of view that differed from the New York Times. The sun set in 2008, but that misfortune ultimately gave Mr. Lipsky the time to produce the remarkable book he is going to discuss tonight. And about that, let me simply quote what Bernard Nussbaum, the former White House counsel, has said. Only Seth Lipsky could take our Constitution, break it down paragraph by paragraph, line by line, word by word, and tell the ongoing tale behind each of these provisions, and bring them to life with real people grappling with real issues. The citizen's constitution is more than an annotation. It reads like a novel and will be enjoyed by all lawyer and non-lawyer alike for years to come. So it takes more than simply being the most interesting mind in journalism to do that. It takes someone with a lifetime of writing and experience and a love for the historic experiment that is the United States of America. And it is our honor to welcome such a person right now, Seth Lipsky. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Doris. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rick Richmond, and thank you, uh, Dean Eastman, for all those generous comments. I heard about this wonderful lecture series from Norman Podoritz, who enjoyed his time here very much, and I'm happy to be with you as well, though I don't mind saying that um, I'm always a bit wary of public speaking because of what I call the Florida mystery. Uh, this turned up when I was editor of The Forward. Um, we had uh, uh, we were mystified as to why, although the paper had a robust national circulation, the number of subscribers had dropped off sharply in the state of Florida. Eventually, we realized that Florida was the only state in which I'd made an organized speaking tour. <laughs> um, today, I, I want to talk about why I believe our country is in a constitutional moment. Uh, my hope is that most of the time here will be devoted to taking your questions, but I, at the start I want to spend some time just sketching the essential points and the broad themes which you can discern in this book, The Citizen's Constitution. It's not a political book, by the way, a point that was remarked on with a little touch of astonishment by the New York Times uh, reviewer. Uh, the Constitution is neither a Republican nor a Democratic document. My own view is that the language in the Constitution is so plain that it doesn't need a lot of spin. And it has rarely glinted so brightly as it does today when we have this new president, himself a former uh, teacher of constitutional law, at least in theory, uh, who has been uh, lofted to office on a campaign of change and has acceded at a time of war and economic crisis and when all sorts of astounding issues from abortion to uh, gun control to uh, uh, same gender marriage and to uh, health care uh, are coming to the fore. When I speak of this constitutional moment, what I mean is that those of us who believe, who are advocates of modest and limited government, we are not going to get much help from this particular Congress and this particular administration. Um, the President and the Speaker, uh, Mrs. Pelosi, uh, want an expansion of government right now, not a modest one, they are lunging for an unprecedented amount of power. Uh, Rick Richmond over dinner tonight said, uh, you know, for a real schematic of what they've got, take a look at this amazing budget that's just been handed in. Uh, and so I predict that we will find ourselves in the coming years and maybe the coming months 
having to turn to the Constitution uh, to protect our liberty from a runaway Congress. The ground that I have been predicting that is going to open before us is a broad national struggle over the doctrine of enumerated powers, which Dean Eastman just referred to. It's the principle that our government is one of powers that are limited and listed in the Constitution. It's one of the great slabs of American bedrock. It's the principle that Congress has only those powers that are listed in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. It can lay and collect taxes. It can build post offices and postal roads. It can declare war. It can raise an army. It can raise a navy. It's unclear, by the way, whether it can raise an air force. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, the courts have let that slide, but it's not in the Constitution, and the other two separate branches are. Um, it can coin money, and it can regulate its value. Uh, one list I saw counted 36 particular enumerated powers, and all the rest, all of it, is reserved to either the states or to the people themselves. So I first predicted we were going to... Uh, see a fight over enumerated powers in early November in a weekend interview in the Wall Street Journal. After the interview was published, the editor of the journal, uh, Paul Gigot, uh, who, by the way, is as shrewd a newspaper man as I've ever met, um, uh, called me on the phone and he predicted that uh, this notion uh, of a, a constitutional moment was going to uh, resonate. And uh, he wasn't kidding. Uh, when the journal uh, published that interview, the Citizens' Constitution suddenly zored on the Amazon.com list from number 18,000 to number 15 in a matter of three hours. I was right up there with Sarah Palin and Stephen King. <laughs> For, forgive the uh, sounding a bit vainglorious, but what is a simple annotation of the American Constitution doing up there? I mean, certainly the reason is not me. When I, what I hear everywhere, uh, when I speak and when I go on the radio, is that people are sensing a, a shift here. They are watching this sudden expansion of government, this lunge for power in Washington, and they're asking where the hell the government gets the power to do this stuff um, that it's talking about doing. Uh, running car companies, bailing out banks, planning to require people to buy health insurance. And, and, and the phenomenon is being sensed not only in audiences uh, like this and communities like this, but in, in, in Washington. Three weeks after that interview, uh, the Republicans in the Senate, I think they were led by Senators DeMint and uh, Ensign, uh, raised a rare constitutional point of order against the health care bill. Where, among other things they asked about, is the government getting the power to require Americans to purchase health insurance or, or to set up a national health insurance company? Uh, Senator Baucus gave the Democratic response, saying it would get the power under the Interstate Commerce Clause and the General Welfare Clause. And with that, he brushed it off. And it may be that sparring between senators is not the right way to work out all of this, and that it will have to get worked out under the judicial power of the United States. It's an interesting phrase. The judicial power is used at the beginning of Article Three of the Constitution, which begins by saying, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. But what in blazes is the judicial power? It, it turns out there's a body of law on that. Um, and it is not an advisory power. The president can't telephone the Chief Justice of the United States and say, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, is it okay if I sign this law? Uh, and Nancy Pelosi can't call up the court and say, uh, are you going to overrule me on this? It, 
it turns out that judicial power is the power to decide what is called actual cases and controversies. And I think that's actually an important thing to bear in mind because it means that um, you know, one can only speculate how it might come up in, say, health care, um, how it might get into the courts. Maybe someone will get arrested for uh, failing to purchase health insurance and decide uh, that rather than plead guilty, he or she is going to fight for uh, their rights. Suppose the government decides to take Max Baucus's position and claim that it has the power to require them to buy health insurance under the General Welfare Clause. You know, uh, uh, it's like Clint Eastwood, go ahead, make my day. Um, the General Welfare Clause appears right there in the first sentence of Article 1, Section 8, which says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, comma, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. I invite you, if you have a copy of this book, to, 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 to read that clause in plain English. It turns out the general welfare clause is not a general grant of power to the Congress, but a restriction on its power to tax. It can only do so for the common defense and general welfare. And just for the record, this was recognized at the time they wrote the Constitution, at the time our founders wrote it. But it irked the wordsmith who did the final language for the Constitution, who was a scoundrel called Governor Morris. He actually plotted to change the text by adding a dot over that comma, making it into a semicolon. And that would have altered the meaning of the sentence so that the business about providing for the common defense and general welfare was not, in fact, limiting language on the taxing power, but an open-ended authority to spend. The plot, by the way, was discovered by the other founders and foiled. And eventually, uh, there was testimony on it in the House of Representatives by Albert Gallatin, who was one of our early Treasury secretaries. There's a constitutional law professor in New York at Columbia, Philip Hamburger, who has described the whole thing as set by saying, rarely has so much rested on so small a point. <laughs> I like that story, uh, which I relate in the book, by the way, in footnote 81, uh, because it underscores the point I keep making about the Constitution, which is pay attention to its plain language. Uh, Madison, incidentally, also addressed this question in 41 Federalist, where he labeled as a, quote, misconstruction, the notion that the general welfare clause amounted to, as he put it at the time, an unlimited commission to exercise every power which may be alleged to be necessary for the common defense and general welfare. If that were the point of the general welfare grant, he argued, why would the founders have proceeded to list all the things that Congress was allowed to do? So it would be fun to see uh, Mr. Baucus brought into court on that point. Uh, and I, if I were him, I wouldn't bet too much on it. I'm not so sure I would take for granted that Congress has the power to do all it wants to do on health care under the Interstate Commerce Clause either. It is true that the power to regulate interstate commerce is one of the enumerated bedrock powers to regulate, it's a good word, regulate interstate commerce. But it's also true that history teaches us that a challenge to federal power under this clause can come from ordinary citizens and to devastating effect. This was exactly what happened during the Great Depression when agents of President Roosevelt's 
I called them agents, thugs. Uh, President Roosevelt's National Recovery Administration, which had been trying to regulate almost all businesses in the United States under a law called the National Industrial Recovery Act. Uh, they overreached and they went and arrested the operators of a kosher poultry business in Brooklyn, known as the Schechter Brothers. Roosevelt brought a number of criminal charges against them, one of which was the crime of letting their customers choose which chicken they wanted to buy, <laughs> which offended the new dealers because they wanted to streamline the industry. The Schechter brothers, who were perfectly decent family men, uh, decided to fight, and their case went to the Supreme Court where the government defended its actions under, among other doctrines, and I mention that because there were a number of doctrines at issue, but one of them was the Interstate Commerce Clause. They said they had the right to do this because they could regulate interstate commerce. The court didn't buy it. Not even one justice bought that argument. And they stunned the New Deal by ruling for the Schecters nine to nothing and stopping the New Deal in its tracks. <laughs> After the ruling, the justices of the court invited back into chambers Roosevelt's emissary, who was a famous lawyer called Thomas Corcoran, known as Tommy the Cork. Uh, and uh, supposedly Justice Brandeis got him back in chambers and he said, Tommy, you go back there and you tell the president it's over, meaning this centralized government, your lunge for power. That was the case, by the way, that prompted Roosevelt to try to pack the Supreme Court, an effort that was stopped in the Senate. And the Schechter's case has gone on to be one of the most famous in American history. And one of the things it demonstrates, and a theme that has become so clear to me in the, in the course of, of working on this book, is that the Constitution is what I call a game anyone can play. I don't mean a game in, uh, in, uh, in trivializing it, but rather it's a law that can be accessed and used by ordinary individuals who look at its plain language and conclude that they've got as much right to an opinion about what this document says as Nancy Pelosi does and Max Baucus. So one big fight that I see looming, one ground of uh, these issues is, is the fight over enumerated powers. Another area where I think the ground is opening before us is even more controversial and maybe even more fundamental. And that is in respect of the dollar. You know, we're at a moment when the dollar has collapsed now to below an 1100th of an ounce of gold. And I just wouldn't be surprised to see the whole question of legal tender get back into the courts. It's what I would call a newspaper man's hunch. You know, the dollar, America didn't create the dollar. The founders when the Constitution didn't create the dollar. The dollar is mentioned twice in the Constitution. And it was adopted as the unit of account in 1792. Um, and um, the greenback was created during the Civil War to pay for the Civil War. Uh, and uh, in the years after the war, the uh, courts uh, first ruled against uh, requiring it to be accepted as legal tender, and then they changed their mind. And it's been more than a century uh, since then. And you ask, well, if it's been more than a century, how could it get back into play, this question of whether we have to accept this fiat money that's redeemable only for another piece of paper? Well, and 
I just tell this story to illustrate the surprising ways things can, can arise. Uh, there's, consider a case that's percolating in the state of New York. I'm not going to predict an outcome, but just listen to the facts. The case was filed by the chief judge of the highest court in the state of New York. She's the plaintiff. Her name is Judith Kay. And she filed this case in a court inferior to her court over which she has appellate jurisdiction and she asked that court to order the legislature to give her a raise. I had the same exact reaction. My reaction was to laugh. Uh, but it turns out that both the New York State Constitution and the Constitution of the United States prohibit as a matter of constitutional bedrock, they prohibit the lowering of the pay of a judge. It's right in there. You can't lower the pay of a judge. It's not a joke. It's bedrock. And not only that, uh, and Dean Eastman probably would, could expound on this because he cites the Declaration of Independence, it turns out that judges' pay was one of the actual grievances against King George of England that was enumerated in the Declaration of Independence as a reason for us seceding from England. Uh, George, the Declaration complained, quote, has made judges dependent on his will alone for tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. And it infuriated the Americans. And we declared our independence. So if one can't lower the pay of a judge, what happens if one is paying the judge in a dollar that used to be worth, as recently as a decade ago, a 265th of an ounce of gold, and only 10 years later has collapsed to less than an 1100th of an ounce of gold? Uh, it's amazing. Uh, how and whether the courts will step up to that question, I don't know. But there's not the, just for the record, there's not the slightest doubt in the records of our country of how the founders of America understood a dollar and what they thought it was. They thought it was 416 grains of standard silver. That's what they thought a dollar was. It's the same amount of money, of silver, same amount of grains of silver that was in a coin called the Spanish milled dollar. That's what they all used, and that's what they were talking about when they referred to a dollar. And, you know, we've just come a long way from that conception of a dollar. And my point is simply, is simply this, that history teaches us that it would be unwise to underestimate how powerful the plain language of the Constitution can be or the astonishing things that can be achieved by ordinary individuals like this unhappy judge who wants to be paid more, uh, uh, who, uh, what they can accomplish uh, when they seek to vouchsafe their rights in the Constitution. And one of my favorite cases, and I'll just mention one more and then, and then we can talk. So one of my favorite cases concerns a vagrant who was living in Florida and one day he was put in the dock on charges of having uh, broken into and robbed a pool room. When he was brought into the court, he said to the judge, the Supreme Court says I have a right to a lawyer. The judge responded, uh, not in the state of Florida, you don't, or something to that effect. And the vagrant was convicted and thrown into prison. While he was in prison, he went to the prison library and he wrote out in pencil a series of appeals. I, I read somewhere that he wrote 59 appeals. I, I, was, I had two researchers working on the problem. I was unable to confirm that number. But he, he really uh, went to work in the prison library. 
And one of the appeals he wrote out by hand on a piece of paper and sent to the Supreme Court uh, in a form that's called a pauper's petition. It gets there in the mail stack at the Supreme Court and it was plucked out by some a law clerk and handed up to the justices and they kind of cocked their eyebrows at it. And they assigned one of the greatest lawyers in American history, Abe Fortas, uh, to uh, argue the case. And uh, he won it. And the appeal uh, resulted in one of the most famous rulings in the history of law. That any person accused of crime in America has a right because of the due process clause of the Constitution to have a lawyer. That's part of due process. The court, by the way, uh, proceeded to assign uh, some very high-powered lawyers to defend this vagrant, but the vagrant rejected them all and insisted that they get him a lawyer from the town where the pool room was located. The local lawyer found, I think, it, I think it was a woman who owned an apple orchard, but in any event, he found someone who steered him to a witness who testified that it was someone else who robbed the pool room and that the vagrant was actually innocent and he was acquitted. And his name, which was uh, Clarence Earl Gideon, will be remembered as long as there is an America. And, and what I like about this story is it turns out that this vagrant knew as much about the meaning of the Constitution, where he read it, I don't know, uh, as all these berobed justices that came before him. And I take that actually, and I think we all should take that, as a, as a kind of a inspiring phenomenon. You know, it's a, it's a plain language document. And when we have the Congress in the hands of a party that's lunging for unimagined federal powers and a president who is egging them on, it's really the only lever we've got left right now. And so uh, I wrote this book. I think, um, I hope you like it. And, uh, and if any of this uh, has got your questions, uh, Fermenting, uh, it would be my pleasure to uh, take them. And Doris uh, Montrose has got a microphone, and if you'll just state your name, and uh, I'll do my best. My question to you is, and it's a fear that I have, I agree with what you said, lawyer, whatever. If the Supreme Court decides to rule in the favor of the Pelosi way of thinking, or even the President's way of thinking, where do we go from there? Because if they don't interpret it literally in the way you discussed it, and they decide to rewrite the Constitution, what grounds do we have to appeal that decision? Well, it, it happens to be a very good question. Um, you know, I tell my fellow editors in the paper, don't forget that if they lose in the Supreme Court, you're the person they're going to appeal to. It's a little bit of a wisecrack, but, um, you know, if you lose in the Supreme Court, you kind of have to uh, re retreat and keep struggling. I mean, the, the civil rights struggle lost in Plessy v. Ferguson, and uh, for uh, nearly a century, uh, segregated schools were considered to be um, constitutional, racially segregated schools. And, uh, and then there was a welder in uh, Kansas City uh, named Oliver Brown, who, who didn't like the fact that his daughter, an African-American girl, had to be bused uh, 10 miles across uh, the city uh, to go to an all-black school, and he uh, uh, he uh, got up on his um, you know heels, and he and he fought in court, and the result was uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, and uh, you know the Supreme Court can change its mind. Uh, sometimes it happens because of the makeup of the court. 
legal tender laws uh, were ruled unconstitutional. Uh, and then uh, two new justices came on the court and they were ruled constitutional. They've been that way for a century. Um, so, you know, I think uh, I, I would, my answer to that would be one just has to keep fighting and, and, and look for new cases that throw things into sharp relief. I mean, this, this uh, Citizens United case, which uh, just came down and uh, liberated uh, individuals and labor unions and companies to participate in our political process on the eve of an election. Um, reversed uh, some earlier precedents uh, that is exactly your point. The Supreme Court had gone the wrong way and a Floyd Abrams, uh, the lawyer on Citizens United, one of the lawyers on Citizens United side of this fight, uh, lost in, in uh, McConnell v. SEC, which validated McCain-Feingold. He's in his 70s or 80s maybe. Floyd, he's a magnificent guy by the way. And he kept fighting. He just kept fighting. And, and finally he found a case that threw it into sharp relief all over again and he won. So that would be my answer. Do you think that President Obama's calling out of the Supreme Court in, in, in front of the whole world was an attempt to uh, make sure that in the future that they would think twice before they ruled against it? You, you know, I, I didn't hear all of your phrases, but I think you were asking about uh, the president's uh, denunciation of the Supreme Court at the State of the Union. You know, the New York Sun website, uh, I put an editorial up on the website uh, at four in the morning, the first uh, publication to do so. I thought it was one of the most disgraceful moments I had ever seen in my entire newspaper career. A president of the United States denouncing the Supreme Court of the United States. They were as close to him as uh, the guests here who had come to him as a courtesy to the presidency of the United States and they denounced and he denounced them to their face while egging on his party compatriots to leap to their feet and start jeering and shouting at him. It was just an unbelievable moment in my opinion, disgraceful. And if I were the Supreme Court, I wouldn't go to the State of the Union for the rest of his presidency. I mean, and, and, and you, you know, the president is required by the Constitution to make a report to Congress from time to time, but the Supreme Court is not required to go hear it. And is not required to sit for that kind of abuse. So it's a very good question. Actually. I noticed that in the uh, discussion a moment ago of the Schechter case, uh, in Schechter, page 50 of your book, there's a reference to William Winslow Crosby. Uh, I had the honor of uh, being one of the students at the University of Chicago many years ago. And his interpretation of the Constitution, based upon what I imagine Scalia represents today as original interpretation, original documents, original language, is one that would have sustained the regulation of uh, commerce in God, the Schechter's, and uh, other small businesses as well. He does not see regulation of commerce as regulation of interstate commerce. How do you respond to that? Searching for original understanding. Well, I would. I, I mean, I, I would react by looking to the plain language of the thing, and uh, you know, it says that um, uh, it, the, the Congress is granted the power to um, to regulate interstate commerce or commerce uh, among the states, and. Uh, it's, it's an awfully broad power, uh, but uh, the, the, the plain language of it, you know, if the founders wanted to say that the Congress could regulate any commerce, they could have said that, but they didn't say that. Uh, commerce between the states. Um, 
by the way, the Interstate Commerce Clause is not the only grounds on which the court ruled in that very famous case. There was also a, con uh, a concept called delegation where uh, the, the Congress is not allowed to just say to some government agency in the executive branch, uh, go ahead and make a lot of rules and enforce them. Uh, it, it, it delegated to uh, uh, the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, too much rulemaking authority. That was another big part of that case. But, uh, you know, uh, in the years since Schechter, uh, the courts have granted the government, the government has won back a lot of that uh, interstate commerce power. But recently, uh, there was a case in Texas where, you know, you know, the federal government tried to pass a law, it did pass a law, that said you can't carry a gun near a school. And in Texas, uh, a, a youngster named Lopez was arrested for having a gun near or, near or even in a school. And when the government gets to the Supreme Court, uh, they say, uh, where are you getting the power to write this law? And they said, the Interstate Commerce Clause. And the Rehnquist Court said, what are you talking about? This is not interstate commerce. And they threw the law out. Uh, Lopez is uh, closely watched now by people who believe that the current court is starting to, to uh, uh, limit what the government can get away with under that clause. Uh, and there's a discussion of that in this book, actually. I'm a doctor. I know about medicine. I don't know about this at all. I do know that the executive office of the legislative branch is clearly the think it's a very, very uh, pertinent question. And I think, you know, my instinct is to say I would play the whole, I would play every instrument in the orchestra. I would, I would uh, use um, uh, political action, uh, you know, uh, fighting for candidates who believe in limited and honest government and, uh, and who think constitutionally. I mean, I mean you, you, you know, I'm not making a political endorsement. I don't know Mr. Eastman, but there's a man clearly who, you know, thinks constitutionally. Um, another person in the Congress, actually, who thinks constitutionally is, um, and this is also not an endorsement, I have plenty, plenty of problems with the guy, but is Ron Paul, Dr. Paul. You know, when he, when he looks at a problem, he thinks constitutionally. When he talks about the dollar, I mean, he's looking inside the Constitution and, and, and looking at the language uh, uh, that, that gives the, the government the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof and of foreign coins. Not the value, the print banknotes that are not redeemable in anything and require them uh, to be accepted in settlement of debts. I mean, that's how he thinks. A and I had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago, and he's very smart and shrewd about him. I don't happen to agree with Ron Paul, I digress here for a bit, on the war. But even on the war, he thinks constitutionally. You know, there's a... Right after the Constitution grants the Congress the power to declare war, it grants the Congress the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Any, anybody here know what they are? I mean, uh, 
freebooters. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a license to a private party, right, 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 to carry on acts of war. Uh, they were used to arm privateers, uh, to go after pirates. Uh, our country actually didn't issue a whole lot of these, uh, but it did issue some. Uh, I think the last one it issued was to a blimp called the Resolute, which stood off the coast of California in World War II and was uh, granted a letter of mark to enable it to carry weapons and on the lookout for uh, submarines. Uh, but so when we were attacked on uh, September 11th, 2001, Ron Paul looks in the Constitution and says, you know, what are we going to do about this? He, he didn't like the idea of sending a vast army overseas. He said, why don't we issue some letters of mark and let some private companies or, or adventurers go after Osama bin Laden and keep his money if they can get it. Uh, you know, I am a supporter of the war, but it's not a stupid position. Uh, Ron Paul. It's a very shrewd position and he's thinking constitutionally. He's actually sitting there thinking, what powers do I have? What tools does this document give me? And, and in any event, uh, the, the question was, what can you do? I mean, I would, I recommend political action. I recommend standing up for one's rights. I mean, if someone is arrested uh, for not having insurance, I think I'd be inclined to fight it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've chosen newspaper work uh, to do a lot of my fighting, but uh, there are trade associations, there are religious institutions, uh, there's Citizens, Un uh, Citizens United, what a remarkable organization. You know, they wanted to make a movie attacking Hillary Clinton, and along comes the government and says you can't do it in, uh, this close to an election. I mean, it's just ridiculous, and they decided to fight. And you know, it cost them years of effort, and I'm sure millions of dollars, and they won one of the greatest victories in the history of the court. I mean, it's astounding. Uh, so my answer would be to play every note and pedal on the organ, every instrument in the orchestra. Just what are the rules for impeachment? <laughs> <laughs> Is there any way that this man could right now be impeached? Um, violate the Constitution. Pardon me? So, uh, impeachment is an accusation that, uh, that, is, uh, that the Constitution empowers the House of Representatives to make uh, on, on, I believe, a simple majority vote uh, against the President and certain other federal officials. Um, and uh, it's for uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. Very, very broad, very, very broad ground as to what uh, is grounds for impeachment. And if the, uh, you know, the, the House of Representatives becomes like a grand jury, uh, it doesn't have to have a lot of evidence. You know, uh, in, in law they say a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich. Um, but then it has to go over to the Senate, and, and the Senate acts like a pettit jury, like a regular jury. And there, they don't have to be unanimous, but I think you have to have two-thirds of the Senate agreeing on the charge. And that has proven to be, in American history, uh, a very high hurdle. I think there have only been, um, check me on this, I think there have only been 16 people who have been impeached. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very uh, difficult process, and it should be, because when millions of people go to the trouble of installing someone in office, you don't want it to be easy to foil that vast democratic outpouring. Uh, I'm not saying uh, President Obama couldn't be impeached. But I do think it would be difficult, and based on what I've seen so far, I would think political action and people like uh, 
uh, this uh, state senator in Massachusetts, who uh, uh, Scott Brown, uh, you know, is, is probably a more fruitful line of attack. I guess is my uh, my instinct. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, so, Doris. Okay, here we go. Right. The last six months I've been down with this terrible nightmare, and I'm hoping relieve my fear. And that is that between now and what I thought would be three years, but now maybe between now and November, two of the Supreme Court justices will be the bench for various reasons. And the current Congress and our president will the place into those seats um, definite till the very far legal end. The question is, does the current makeup of Republicans in Congress have the ability to prevent that occurrence? Uh, you know, I uh, you know we're right on the knife edge of uh, of the ability uh, to block cloture and uh, keep things from coming to the floor for a vote. And um, that's why the Scott Brown election was so important. Uh, I, I think one can take it as a given that President Obama will uh, nominate for the next opening someone who's pretty far to the left. Uh, but. But I, it's not actually what I have nightmares about because history also teaches us that once one gets on the Supreme Court, um, one can be fairly unpredictable. I mean, Earl Warren, one of the most liberal justices, was uh, a put on the bench by a conservative. Um, and You know, I, I was uh, I was over at Dara's uh, Montrose's house uh, yesterday. I think it was, or the day before, uh, talking about uh, uh, something that I've also come to feel as a result of my work on this. I actually don't think the judges, or even the lawyers, are the most important part of the legal process. This is a minority view. It's a Lipsky theory. And my view is that the most important part of the legal process are the litigants, the people who actually throw themselves into a legal battle as the client, you know, not the uh, clients, the litigants. It's it's true that uh, Ginsburg and Breyer uh, and uh, uh, Stevens. And uh, uh, Sotomayor were, you know, a solid liberal bloc so far. But uh, people who know uh, Justice Sotomayor are not certain she's going to vote uh, with the liberal side always, for example. Uh, and, you know, one of the most important cases before the court now was heard on December 8th, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a case that was brought by one of the minority owners of the New York Sun, Conrad Black, who's in prison, um, he's in prison under a law called the Honest Services Statute, which is one of these vague statutes that prosecutors have used to go after white-collar criminals for years. And, and finally, Conrad Black and two other persons convicted under this law stood up and, and said, we'll carry it to the Supreme Court. And when it got to the court on December 8th, the government, which was trying to defend this law, was attacked from the bench by the following people. Sotomayor, Ginsburg, Breyer, Anthony Kennedy, John Roberts, and uh, Antonin Scalia. I mean, you know, when you get the right kind of, we don't know how they're going to rule yet, but, it's, but every newspaper that covered it said, whoa, uh, what's going on here? So I just, I guess I would have to be in the camp that would encourage you to guard against cynicism and try to 
keep your fears and nightmares under control and, and just focus on the, on the rightness of your cause. Thank you for letting me sleep better. <laughs> for, for what? Thank you for helping me to sleep better. You're welcome. I'm going to come to you with my medical problems. This confirms my theory, which I noticed when I went to law school in Berkeley, that the brightest people on the faculty were the ones who were not trained as lawyers. Well, th th thank you, but uh, there's some great lawyers too. I mean, uh, come on. Now, let, let me ask another question. Several people have spoken about how concerned they are about what they can do against the uh, drive for power of the present regime. Um, as someone who's about to serve on a jury, uh, perhaps you'd comment on the notion of jury nullification, which I prefer to call jury empowerment. Uh, would you agree that under the Constitution, that the jury is the sole judge of the law, the facts, and how they are applied to each other, and that it has the right and duty to bring in a non-guilty verdict in a criminal case in defiance of the law of the facts, in defiance of the judge's instructions, if it disagrees with the law or the way the law is being applied. You know, I, again, I apologize for this. You're asking me how I feel about jury nullification? Sure. Right. You know, this is one of the great checks and balances that we all hear about is, is the uh, extraordinary power uh, that is vested in, in juries. Uh, and, you know, one of the greatest cases in the history of America, it was actually before the constitutional era, uh, was involved a guy a lot of you may have heard of called uh, Peter Zenger who had a newspaper in New York that criticized the, the king's governor in New York and he was brought up on charges of criminal libel. And in those days, uh, the way the law worked is the greater the truth of the article, the greater the libel. In other words, the, the practice then was that if it wasn't true, it wasn't harmful. Uh, but if it was true, it really hurt. Uh, uh, when it got to court, uh, Zenger had a lawyer called uh, Alexander Hamilton. Andrew, Andrew Hamilton. Andrew Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was the other guy, the famous guy. Andrew Hamilton, I guess. Uh, and when it, when it got to court, uh, Hamilton gets up and he says, um, you know, he uh, articulates this uh, greater the truth, the greater the libel thing. Uh, and he says, um, so um, my client admits he printed this matter, so what you've got to decide here is whether you believe him. <laughs> and, and the jury said no, they acquitted him. They re rejected his confession because they hated the governor so much. It was the most famous case of jury nullification in American history. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the Crown Heights riots in Brooklyn, uh, uh, an Orthodox Jewish a man, uh, Rosenbaum, who was walking through uh, Brooklyn, was murdered by a mob of, uh, of uh, youths, uh, one of whom was arrested in possession of the knife, the bloody knife, uh, with Rosenbaum's money in his pocket. And the youth was identified by Rosenbaum as he lay dying in the hospital. Uh, and when it got to court, uh, the, uh, the accused killer, Lemrick Nelson, was acquitted. 
in a case of uh, jury nullification. It's one of the most disgraceful things in the history of New York. But jury nullification is, a, is an issue that's out there. I, you know, uh, sometimes it seems like a good thing in the case of uh, Peter Zenger, and sometimes the thing uh, seems like a terrible thing, like in the case of Lemmy <coughs> Nelson. And, uh, and I don't know what to say about it in the context of a book on the Constitution other than the fact that uh, uh, juries are part of the bedrock system of uh, checks and balances that we kind of have to live with. Now, during the Jim Crow era in the South, the uh, juries were nullifying uh, uh, cases where uh, uh, racists had uh, done harm to minorities. Um, and we brought in a civil rights law that said uh, we can try these individuals a second time for civil rights violations. And, and the theory, you know, uh, no one's allowed under the Constitution to be put in jeopardy twice. But the theory of those civil rights era is they were never actually in jeopardy the first time. Uh, so there is a body of law that deals with jury nullification in certain situations, but it's a, juries are a part of the bedrock. Uh, does that uh, answer your point? Or? Okay, uh, uh, Doris, who have we got here? Okay, there you go. A couple of weeks ago, the Senate voted against the Commission of All the Water, and it's addressed but I don't like their voting, so I'm just going to write an executive order to address that issue. Does he have the right to do that? And so what is that possible? You know, I'm not here to practice law. And, and, I don't, and I'm not a lawyer. And I don't really know the answer to that with any certainty. But there is this principle of delegation and and the Congress cannot just say your president enforce the law it can't give away its powers it has to write the rules and the executive has to enforce them and I can imagine that if there is a sense that the executive was trying to write law that the Congress wouldn't pass uh, there would be the grounds of back to that point I made at the beginning, an actual case and controversy to be laid before the court. That's my instinct to your question, without knowing the particulars of that regulation you referred to. I wondered if you could just give a bit of an explanation to what Professor Obama was referring to when he said that um, the Supreme Court had overturned 100 years of precedence. Uh, my understanding was that the most recent thing was that Austin versus I mean, the general uh, view there uh, is that the president was wrong. Uh, I mean, even uh, Linda Greenhouse, my classmate, who's a very bright person, but is about as liberal as a reporter can get, uh, fetched up in the New York Times the next day saying he was wrong on the merits. I mean, and, and frankly, I thought it was incredible that a State of the Union message could have such a factual error in it. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess, I, uh, you know, uh, Rick Richmond has actually read these cases and, and he might know of what the president was referring to. There might be some fine point that went back a hundred years. But in fact, he was, uh, the court had dealt with relatively uh, recent precedent. Uh, 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 Rick tells me that there's a really magnificent opinion in that case uh, by uh, Scalia, uh, which is only like eight pages uh, he was telling me at dinner tonight. And, and there's another uh, wonderful opinion by uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas uh, where uh, 
Thomas felt the court didn't go far enough. Uh, he felt that uh, the court ought to uh, also protect uh, anonymous um, uh, contributions. Is that right, Rick? Rick? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the theory that where did Congress, it said Congress shall make no law. It didn't say Congress shall make no law except if the person is anonymous. It said Congress shall make no law or, uh, abridging freedom of the speech. It's just, uh, it, 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 so I don't know if I answered your question. But. You were talking about all the tools in the toolbox and the um, question that was raised at prior other kinds of right. was also along the same lines. But my question is similar in that um, what, you know, besides tea parties, which is one thing, the nice part about this last election is it woke us all up, but now that we're awake, how do we formulate ourselves to really come out with a bigger push to be noticed more? Because we know that we failed in our campaign effort to put a conservative in the White House, so it just isn't, and, and on the other side really did a good job putting their campaign together. We have to, you know, besides tea parties, let's the real step? Well, first of all, I would think the Tea Parties would be a good step. I mean, a classic uh, kind of step. Uh, meetings like this, I mean, uh, someday there'll be a statue of uh, Doris Wise Montrose uh, in front of the Skirball Center for what she's doing here. Uh, and, and, you know, you, uh, you know, forgive the corny phrasing, but, but you're not alone. I mean, th this kind of ferment is going on all over the country. You know, you know my, my uh, advice, and I risk sounding like a sap, uh, is to uh, avoid cynicism and withdrawal uh, in the face of defeat. You know, I like that uh, MacArthur. I shall return. You know, I mean, so we lost this election. We had a we had a Republican who went to the hustings, uh, uh, jeering at the business and, and capital, and uh, uh, we had this uh, brilliant vice presidential candidate who uh, was making her first uh, step onto the national stage. Um, uh, you know, I think we've got a, we've sort of, I think we've got a lot to work with, frankly. I mean, I think we've got a lot to work with. I think people all over this country are saying, "Where is the government getting the power to do all this stuff?" And we've got to keep pressing those questions. And 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 you know, there's a law, there's a, a bill they call it. It's not yet a law. There's a bill in the Congress which would require the Congress to attach. To every piece of legislation, a statement of where in the Constitution they're getting the authority to pass the confounded law. And uh, it's so clear. I mean, so, you know, it's a great question to ask a Congress member. Say, where are you getting? authority. Where in the Constitution? That's not what the General Welfare Clause means. That's not what the Interstate Commerce Clause means. Uh, and look for candidates. Look for candidates who think constitutionally. Uh, you know, Doris, actually, in her opening remarks, uh, uh, made, made a very profound and basic point. These rights were not given to us by the Constitution. We always had them. Like, I like the way George Bush said it. You know, this, this freedom is a God-given thing to everyone. What the Constitution does is it prohibits the government from taking it away. And, and that's, what, that's, that's the use of this thing. That's the use of this thing. And it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant conception, these founders. Forgive me for getting on my high horse. Yes, go ahead, sure. Um, I had read somewhere, and I don't know if it's true, that Obama made the comment that he's flustered about the Constitution because it tells him what he can't do, not what he can do. And that just shows how this he has, to me, this guy has no wisdom, but I think he's also a lot of smart as what he thinks. Um, you know, I actually think you put it put it very well. I mean, the Constitution. Uh, 
How can you say that? He's an idiot. The, the, the Constitution, in fact, doesn't tell the president what he can do. It does give him certain powers as commander in chief and certain responsibilities. And, and, the, and the basic responsibility it gives him, and, and it's really wonderful the way the what's called the constitutional oath is worded. Uh, you know, they don't. It doesn't say I, I shall uh, be loyal to America. Uh, it says I sh I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend N not America, the Constitution of the United States. I mean, it's it's just an amazing, an ama You know, one of the most fabulous things about America is is that it really is a group of individuals who are bound by their allegiance to a law the, it, it, what makes an american you know an american is its allegiance to the constitution not the race not the country they came from uh it's just the willingness to bow to this law i mean it's an amazing thing, actually. Yes, sir, right there. Do you think George Washington may have been correct when he argued before the I, I just, uh, it's not coming through here. Uh, George Washington. George Washington stated that lawyers should be kept out of the legislative branch. <laughs> So, you know, you've got a little detail of history that you're ahead of me on here. Uh, but I will tell you that, that from, uh, from, you know, going through all this, and I'm not a great scholar, again, I'm a newspaper editor, but Washington was a fabulous figure. I mean, he was just so... He w I mean, he was just so good, balanced, he so understood this this business about the n the negative way in which we deal with rights. We don't create the rights; they were always there. We prohibit the government from uh, from uh, from abridging them. Uh, he was really great. Uh, yes, ma'am. When you said to yourself, "Oh my God," that it startled you, that it uplifted you, that it made you feel like you were you yeah, must have been dozens, but I wanted to find out whether there was one part of the research that was transpersonal for you. Actually, that, that's a that's a very very good question. I mean, I, I think the thing that really uh, came through to me uh, in, in a way that I quite hadn't grasped before is just the nature of this enumerated powers issue and how important it is to hold the government to its enumerated powers. Now, my wife, who's a writer called Amity Schles, who specializes in political economy. Has, has been predicting that the, the economic theory we're going to be hearing about in the future is a theory called public choice theory, which holds basically to oversimplify that government is the competitor of business and that it has its own interests and, and, and one has to recognize that. It's, it's like, like Reagan used to say, it's not necessarily you know, the, the scariest words in America are, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you, you know. Uh, <laughs> the government is the competitor of, of those of us who are in the private sector. And, uh, and you know, these realizations are profound. And, and I, I, it sounds corny, but I actually found it quite moving to read the original notes and stuff and see how the uh, founders, uh, I wrestled with all this. I mean, and and our country was in fact not an immaculate conception. I, I mean, 
There are problems the Constitution couldn't solve. Uh, the biggest one was slavery. I mean, it was a um, it was a uh, compromise. It, it was countenanced in the Constitution, and uh, uh, you know the the tragedy of that com compromise uh, led to uh, not that it could have been avoided. The South was obdurate. Uh, but it led to a war that uh, was the bloodiest in our history, and uh, and judgment wasn't handed down until uh, Appomattox. Um, I found the contemplation of all that very moving. And one of the most moving things was one of the essays that was written by a communist about that, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, who wrote a essay on the. Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how it dealt with this issue. And it was inspiring to see that even Du Bois recognized how torn and involved and focused the founders on both sides were over the moral issue of slavery, over slavery as a moral issue. I mean, the whole thing, it, it can really get to you, frankly. I mean, uh, listen, we, we've been going for a while. I'm happy to take one or two more questions, then, then I'm going to sign some books, and I hope uh, you'll come and uh, sign them, and we can, we can talk a little bit uh, more when, when you do that. But So let's take, uh, Doris, two more questions. Is that about right? The Senate of the Mohawk, so I have a very great affinity for the Constitution of the United States, and I think you referred to the House Rule HR 450, which is Arizona's Shedex, uh, requirement that they have to have the attachment showing the authority of the lower house and the upper house for the legislation proposed. But it's actually a piece of legislation that is enforcing the house rule, I believe it's 13 6 B, which states that, but they keep waiving it and waiving it. Every administration has done Do you think that a piece of legislation could be authored and written requiring the centrist of the Constitution of the United States that both parties have to adhere to, that everything comes from the center, and the center is the Constitution of the United States? Um, you know, I think the constitutional oath is basically taken by, by all these people. And, uh, uh, you know, an additional law might be, uh, might be redundant. I, but, uh, you know, I, 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 you're ahead of me. You're just ahead of me. I have to look at that situation. Um, last question here. Good evening, Seth. My question has to do with the Constitution being the founding document and governing document for citizens of the United States of America, as founded by the founding fathers. Why then are we giving this Constitution to everybody who comes into this country, and criminals included, who are not citizens, illegals, also the people for Guantanamo? Why are we allowing people to use our Constitution who are not citizens of the United States, how can we control it? Uh, th that's a, a very good and a very complicated question. I, I mean, I was with Scalia on the Guantanamo question, and uh, and uh, I, I think the court made an error there, but it's one we're going to have to work out. Uh, I think the idea of, uh, of trying uh, uh, Khalid Sheikh, whatever his name is, uh, uh, in a civilian court is an error of judgment. It's an error of judgment. I don't think it's the end of the world for the country. I just think it's an error of judgment. A bad, by the way, a bad error of judgment. Uh, that, uh, you know, in our courts, you're supposed to get due process. Let me get back up. There's a reason these, 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 these enemies were captured on foreign battlefields, shouldn't be in our courts. In our courts, we're supposed to hand out justice by a process called due process. And due process requires the ability to compel evidence. How in the devil are you going to compel evidence from the mountains of Afghanistan and the, you know, the caves of Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous to me to think that 
a, you know, a civilian trial, let alone in the heart of New York City, is, is the logical way to do this. Uh, you know, the question of, 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 I don't know if you were driving at the question of illegal immigrants and that sort of uh, uh, issue, but um, uh, here it gets a bit more complicated. I mean, if people are here, they are subject to our laws. They are subject to our jurisdiction. I understand that, but, but you know, um, uh, if a tourist comes here and, uh, and, and, uh, and robs uh, and, and shoots somebody on a subway, he's going to be subject to our jurisdiction. We're not going to hand it back to France. Uh, so it, it just gets complicated, and, and I don't have I don't have all the uh, all the answers. I do know that naturalization is an enumerated power given to the Congress. It can basically do what it wants, um, and uh, and I think with a lot of things like this, the way forward is to look into this document and its plain language and see what it says. And frankly, you're as good at doing that as I am. That's my answer to all of you. And so read it and, and study it and, and, and get involved and, and press your case. And uh, that's, that's what I would recommend. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll go sign some books and uh, I look forward to meeting you there.